Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Michelle Steen and I am the manager of public programs at Crocker. I'm so glad to have you all here tonight for a really wonderful program. Um, I'd like to start with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the Crocker Art Museum is on the traditional land of the Nisenan people and California is the homeland of many tribes. We are honored to be here today and are committed to working with these Native nations as we move forward as an inclusive institution. I will add that the land the museum sits on is unceded territory and recognize that the institution of the Crocker was founded through and has benefited from colonialism. This was largely from wealth gained by the Crocker family from the transcontinental railroads and the lands the railroads crossed. We're including a link in the chat where you can learn more about two local tribes, the Nisenan tribe of the Nevada City Rancheria, who continue to seek federal recognition. And please visit their site and support them in their efforts. We also thank the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians and the Cultural Services Division, who helped us to develop the Crocker's Land Acknowledgement and continue to share their insight, collaboration, and time. Today, we are lucky enough to have artists representing both of these tribes. Some logistics, please make sure to use the chat feature to communicate with us and other attendees. You can directly ask uh, Crocker Art Museum any logistical questions. Questions for the artists can go in the Q&A. And if you wanna access live closed captions, you click on the button at the bottom of your screen. This chat will be fairly active. So if it's interfering with the captioning, we recommend that you open the chat so it appears on the right of your screen. If you support the ideas that we're engaging with and what we offer, we hope you consider becoming a member or making a donation if you're able. And we are very excited that the museum is open as well. If you want to um, reserve tickets, you can go online to our website and do so. Uh, several of the artists here tonight have worked in the exhibition Multiple Horizons, Native Perspectives at the Crossroads and Tribal Perspectives from the Confluence. You can view both of these amazing exhibitions online. We'll share the link to that in the chat. Um, these two exhibitions were curated in collaboration with Concept Art Plus Movement and Incubator of Arts and Culture El Dorado and the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians Exhibits and Collection Center in collaboration with the Traditional Ecological Knowledge Department. So now it's my great pleasure to welcome our presenting artists tonight, Jackie Calanchini, Melissa Tayaba, Melissa Malero moose Mio Marufo, and Shelly Covert. Welcome everybody. We're very excited to have you here tonight. Um, we're going to start with um, hi, hi Shelly, hi Melissa, hi Jackie, hi Mio. And um, we're going to start with Melissa Tayaba. I'm going to share uh, a PowerPoint and we're going to look at some of your work. All right, there we go. So um, this is actually a piece that's in the Crocker collection. Um, I don't believe it's on view right now, but uh, we often bring it out. So hopefully it will be in the future soon. So Melissa, this piece uh, is in um, the multiple or the um, multiple horizons exhibition and uh, I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about your work um, and sort of your process. I know you do a lot of different things, but what it took maybe to um, make this piece. Sure. Um, <clears throat> my name is Melissa Tayaba. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, this piece um, really tells a lot about um, what to me a river girl would look like. Um, for me, I chose the Thule skirt um, 
partly I chose the tulle skirt uh, because I was focusing on a plant that um, I know our waterways really need again. And um, so that's why I chose the, the tulle skirt. Um, and also, of course, because traditionally we would wear that. Um, but when I was making this piece, I specifically was thinking of the waterways um, and the fact that I would love um, to see that plant back at those waterways. Um, and so that was kind of my train of thought. Um, and of course her basket is made out of tule also as some sort of gathering basket. Um, and it really was directed to draw attention um, to kind of the issues of water, um, but most importantly, um, to think about Thule and its role in the river and what it can do for the water and the fish. Um, because I think right now that's what we need. That's what we should be thinking about as tribal people. Um, and I think it's important through my art to try to convey some of those issues that uh, we, we deal with. And so Thule is a very, um, very awesome plant that I would love to see back on the waterways. Melissa, thank you for sharing. I have to apologize. I forgot to share your bio, so I'm gonna do that right now. Um, Melissa Tayaba is the vice chairperson of the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians. She's also the director of traditional ecological knowledge and a cultural leader. She helps lead cultural revitalization efforts within her tribe and is passionate about teaching culture and tradition to other tribal members. Her work includes sharing the ways Aboriginal territory and its natural resources have historically been and continue to be utilized and tended to by the Nisenan and Miwok people, teaching the importance of learning and passing down knowledge of traditional practices to the next generation of culture keepers and bringing cultural activities back into the tribal community, such as basketry, regalia making, bead making, traditional song and dance, ceremony, the identification and use of plants, land stewardship, sharing tribal history and language revitalization. Melissa enjoys being outdoors, reconnecting to the land, gathering traditional materials for basket weaving, and spending time along the rivers, tending to the natural resources of her tribe's ancestral homeland. So thank you for bearing with me. I apologize about that. Um, I think that says a lot and this work is, is absolutely gorgeous. Um, can you share with us a little bit about how long it would take to create something like this? I know that includes gathering the materials and probably preparing them in different ways. Yeah, um, how long it would take, you know, it's for the skirt, I think it would obviously take a bit of time, just obviously you're gonna collect your materials first. Um, this skirt is made of course out of tule um, and also dog bane. So it would be a process to get your dog bane. Um, but once you have your supplies, I think it's, it would go fairly quickly. Um, my, the tule that I put on this skirt, I actually emptied out the pith. So it did take a little bit of extra time. Um, so I think you could get a skirt done and, you know, it just would be how determined you are. But if you had your supplies, it would probably just take a day. And then um, looking at this detail of the necklace, can you share kind of more about the process of that? Um, and also, I, I would love to know, you know, how you learn these techniques, how old you were, what, you know, how you've grown in your skill over time. Yeah, um, well, to be quite honest, um, I'm learning, I've been learning for maybe over a little over five years um, and I really tapped into um, other indigenous people of, of the area and um, 
also our history, kind of some of the things that um, elders left for us. Um, and this necklace right here is made out of dog bane, and this dog bane was um, collected in our Aboriginal territory um, in Sacramento. And also these shells are from um, Kadema, or one of our villages. Uh, and I, I learned how to do string um, from men, men in the tribe who helped me with that. And um, they taught me how to gather it. Um, there's a specific time of the year that you would gather it, which is uh, right at winter, basically. And um, it's really about having all of your supplies and ready to go. Obviously, if I wanted to make a dog bane necklace um, right now, um, there is no dog bane right now to gather. So you have to kind of collect things when they're available and think about your supply throughout the year. Um, so this particular necklace, um, I thought it was, you know, it's so awesome to say like, this all came from my village site. Um, it's part of me and it's a reflection of, of who I am. Um, where will this work live? Where does it live? Um, this work lives, um, I would say here at home. Um, it's gonna be used in ceremony. Um, and it's definitely alive. And I would say it would be at our village sites. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, um, and my knowledge is very limited on this, but I, I know that there's been advocacy around um, limiting the use of pesticides and things like that because of the impact that they have on materials and plants and, and things. Um, do you do any of that in your work or what, what did, how does your work intersect with that? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of one of the concerning things is as you know, you know, what the state of our rivers right now is like what's left of the rivers. And so as you go gather in your, in your territories, it's really um, hard, you know, you're dealing with homeless, um, you're dealing with pesticides. And so you have to be very careful about what you're gathering. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, traditionally, a lot of this is going in your mouth. So you have to be very mindful of where you're collecting um, because it, it's very important. You don't want um, obviously to get sick, obviously you don't want your plants sick. Um, so where you gather is um, a special area that you invest your time and your soul, you know? So it's very um, important. Um, our gathering areas are very, very important. And um, so things like pesticides are not good. And a couple more details there. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing this. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. And I you know we're appreciative of, of you sharing your time and knowledge. Um, we also have tonight here, we have Sigrid Benson. Um, if Sigrid, if you wanna join us by turning your camera on. Um, Sigrid is the Director of Exhibits and Collections in the Cultural Services Division of the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians. So I know the two of you work together um, and Sigrid, you really coordinated and, and helped put together these two exhibitions. I'm hoping you can share a little bit more about sort of the formation of that and how it came to be. Yeah, certainly. And at this time, I'd also invite um, my colleague, Jackie Calentini to share her screen when she's ready. Um, but yes, it's my honor to serve the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians as Director of Exhibits and Collections alongside um, Tribal Curator of Collections, Jackie Calentini. 
um, who's also a very talented artist in this show. Um, and we work um, very closely with the traditional ecological knowledge department in you know, most all of our projects. Um, you know, I'm here to briefly share tonight um, some of the, the ingredients, I guess I would say, um, that form a part of the way this exhibit came together. Um, it's really um, a really valuable thing to be able to work in a community gallery context, I feel, um, and that is where I have been happiest doing my work. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, you know, the intergenerational nature of it um, and the freedom and opportunity it gives to introduce people to the gallery setting um, and, you know, just bring folks into this really important space um, that, you know, gives people such an opportunity to voice um, their convictions, their concerns, their inspirations, both as individuals and as, you know, parts of um, larger communities. And so I would have to acknowledge, um, you know, that a lot of the work that I have had the opportunity to do um, has been guided by um, the mentorship of a very special individual. Um, and that person is Frank Lapina. Um, and actually the title for this exhibition um, originated with um, one of the final pieces um, that he worked on um, that remains unfinished to this day. And that piece, um, you know, as I was able to see him work on it over the last couple of years, you know, he kept adding these horizons um, these layers, um, you know, it would go from mountains to sky, but then there'd be mountains again, and now another horizon line. And so he kept repeating this theme and, and had these very, you know, specific ideas that he was thinking about each time he divided um, the land from the sky um, and really enjoyed talking about that. Um, and that piece remained untitled, but I found myself always thinking about um, it as multiple horizons. That's what it became in my mind. Um, and when we started um, to think about the opportunity to do this um, exhibition with the Crocker Community Gallery, you know, we were thinking about um, the location of Sacramento, the location of the um, Crocker Art Museum in particular, um, and how this area has always been such a powerful um, meeting place. And so initially, the first um, part of the exhibit became Native Perspectives at the Crossroads, simply to you know, draw attention to the fact that the different communities who um, have always been here and those who are here now, um, and all of the others who have, um, you know, who now occupy this area, um, bring their own perspective and their own vision to that very special place where the land meets the sky. Um, so that's how the theme emerged. Um, and then we really started thinking about the location of the Crocker Art Museum. And so the idea of archeological horizons, right? These different layers um, that are looked at and talked about in different ways. It, that kind of slipped in there too, because we were thinking about, um, you know, placing the viewer in this building, in this structure that is on top of all of these, you know, horizons where, um, you know, the ancestors of, um, you know, the Shingle Springs band families and others um, lay. And so we just wanted to create an opportunity for people to situate themselves and think about where they stand um, when they were viewing this artwork. And from there, I would say it evolved in a really beautiful way when we had an opportunity to um, install a second um, exhibit because 
you know, through the conversations with the um, tech department, you know, Melissa's um, strong advocacy for the waterways brought in the idea of, you know, then shifting our perspective, right, from thinking about the land and the crossroads to the confluence um, and the importance um, of that spot to the river people. So, um, you know, with that, I think I will hand it off to Jackie to share some of her perspectives on this. Thank you, Sigrid. Um, I will say, you know, one thing I feel very sad about is that the museum hasn't been able to be open during the run of, of you know, the part of Multiple Horizons. So, um, but I think the images that were taken are really good and I encourage everyone to, especially now look at, look at the exhibition. Um, so um, I'm gonna introduce Jackie too. Um, Jackie Kalantini is a tribal member of the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians. As the tribal curator of collections, Jackie oversees the tribe's permanent collection, curates the Lowellman Gallery hosting contemporary tribal art exhibitions and creates outreach programs and publications for the Shingle Springs Band community. Jackie is also a certified web and graphic designer traditional basket weaver and newly elected council member. Hi, Jackie. Hi, thanks for having me. So um, this piece that's pulled up right now um, looks like it was, you know, obviously a group effort. Um, Melissa and Jackie, both your names are connected to it. Do you want to both of you speak a little bit about it and how it came to be? Um, so we for sure wanted to do some kind of um, collaboration with tech and with the community. And this design, this triangle that you see is actually part of our tribes um, or resembles our tribe's logo. And we have these you know, sayings at, um, at home about um, one of our publications, for instance, is called Res Kid Treasures. And it's basically about um, helping our young people understand that things that are somewhat insignificant and walked over every day are actually treasures within our culture. And so that's the concept of how this came about. Um, and then just a way to show uh, the multitude of things that we gather and acquire through the year and, and work with tech to bring to the community. I also like that, you know, there, there are children and youth in the exhibition too, which I think is wonderful. You just have a generational span of people who created and are creating together. Um, Absolutely. It's so important, I think, to start kids young at just understanding. Um, and for me, I think it's important to help kids understand what to expect with, um, you know, we're so lucky to even have a tech department and an exhibits and collection department for our tribe. And so just promoting those in a positive way um, for the families, I think is, will benefit us in the future. Um, I'm wondering where, you know, obviously that, I think collaborative projects and if, if you're used to working communally, um, when, when you create a project like this and it involves both education and multiple people coming together, um, how, how do you sort of feed off each other and become inspired by each other and, and do other people come into that mix too? Um, you know, like maybe you were, you were trained about certain things, but also are you inspired by other artists and friends and community members? Um, absolutely. Um, someone that I'm deeply inspired by is Denise Davis, who's also in the show, and she's a Mountain Maidu traditional weaver, and so we've learned a lot from her um, and just excited with her willingness to teach us some of the traditional ways. I think that working with your family um, is obviously an inspiration to have these opportunities as a family to relearn or rediscover some of these things that help us feel connected to our grandmothers. Um, so for me, that's a really important thing is making that connection. 
Um, maybe Melissa, you have more to say about that. Sure. Um, you know, um, the collaboration um, with our department, I think is this, I don't know, kind of cherry on top of the cake type thing. It's, you know, we have this big word like tech and then we have this other big word, it exhibits and collections and most tribes don't have those. And so to be able to form these things, um, what exhibits and collections really does is it creates a platform for us to really display the things that we want. And um, I think that this relationship has been working so well um, for many, many reasons. Um, but some of them are the fact that tribal members actually get to do this thing that looked so sophisticated, but actually when you're doing cultural things, it's beautiful. And um, so I know that the tech department, it, it's just brought us into kind of a different world um, and given us, it's giving us a platform to show who we are in, in some respect. And, um, I think also it's really introduced us to this, this, this new world of art um, and other tribes and other tribal people and what is coming out of their villages and their hearts. So it's been really nice to be able to see all of these different um, perspectives and how people portray them outward. Um, so it's, um, it's just a, a blessing that we actually have this sort of relationship um, where, where we can do things like this. Um, part of the revitalization, you know, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of years, and then to have shows like this where you can really show what you want is, um, it's really beautiful. Um, I want to show some of Jackie's work, uh, some of which is in the exhibition, but these first pieces aren't. Um, so Jackie, would you mind sharing with us a little bit like Melissa did about your process and maybe how long it takes to make these pieces and just what it looks like for you? Um, right. So um, these are some baskets I've made just kind of on my journey to, to learn about traditional basketry. Um, our area, the Sacramento area, doesn't have a lot of baskets and repositories um, or museums and to where we can go and learn from them. And so seeking out people who have that knowledge, um, both native and non-native, uh, going to other institutions like out in Berkeley or Oakland, just to get glimpses of baskets that were from our area. Um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing journey, but so these are some of my twined work that, that I've been learning along the way. Um, the first one to the left there is made from dog vein and willow, or excuse me, creek dogwood and willow. And then we have in the center whole willow shoots and dog vein strap and then a tule basket. So um, this is a twine style. Um, it's just every, every gathering trip, every learning um, trip is just such a journey. And I know for instance that I've been learning basketry for probably five or six years and I have yet really to create like a coiled basket which is a, a popular style from, from California. Um, and that's okay too, because there's so many things to learn before I get there from tending the plant up. Um, and so these just remind me of, of all of those journeys that, that I have had and that I have yet to have. So I just thought, um, you know, it would, it'd be something fun to share because it feels like such an accomplishment, I think, for for people who didn't have, it wasn't easy to, to come about learning these things, so. 
Yeah, and I mean, I don't, I don't know if you can talk about these things without sort of talking about history of erasure and, you know, intentional loss. And um, I, I love, I just love all of these pieces, and I'm, it's really inspiring to see, you know, the work that you're making. So, Thank you. um, there are also three watercolors that are in the exhibition. Um, that I was hoping you could talk a little bit about. Um, I find them really evocative and it, it feels like looking at kind of an old photograph and I, um, could you maybe share the subject matter and, and how you created these? Yeah, um, so they are from photographs of our relatives and um, these were kind of my way to pay respect as we're learning, uh, we're, our information is coming from all over the place. We're having to travel out to read documents, we're online, we're asking family, elders, friends, and old neighbors. And so these are some images of our relatives that I've come across in our research and that just stood out to me. And so um, the first one, Honeybee and Nellie are both my grandmothers. Um, and then we have a picture of blind Tom. And with him, I, I've never met Tom. He um, was around in the early 20th century, but he was an informant to Miriam. And just the little bit of information that he was willing to give to him really helped us kind of navigate through more of our own research and help us settle on locations and whatnot. And so uh, these images just really stuck with me. And, you know, I just had fun making them basically. I think watercolor can be a really um, intimate medium. So mm -hmm. it's like a nice choice for something like that. Um, I also like how there, there's a little bit of like monochromatic to it as well. So maybe that, that sepia tone kind of photographic memory. Um, how, can I ask how big these pieces are? I wanna say they're not very large. Um... I think they're on like a 18, no, no, they're not that big. Definitely larger than a regular like printer size piece of paper. I don't remember the dimensions. Mm -hmm. right now. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Well, um, thank you all three of you for sharing this work and for your time. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, I feel so excited to be able to see these pieces. And um, I know our participants are as well. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, at this time, I want to introduce another Melissa we have tonight. Um, so Melissa Malera Moose is a um, Northern Paiute enrolled with the Fallon Paiute Shoshone tribe with ties to Fort Bidwell, Paiute, California. Melissa holds a BFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts and a BS in Psychology and Fine Arts from Portland State University. Her works are part of the permanent collections of the School for Advanced Research, the Autry Museum, IAIA Museum of Contemporary Native Arts, the Nevada State Museum, and the Lilly Museum at the University of Nevada. She is currently exhibiting regionally and nationally as an individual artist with the Great Basin Native Artists, the GBNA Art Collective. Her influences are imagery found in the Great Basin landscape, petroglyphs, beadwork, and basketry from the indigenous tribes of Nevada and California. Melissa currently lives with her family in Hungry Valley, Nevada, working as a professional artist, contributing writer for First American Art Magazine, and founder, independent curator of the GBNA. Hi, Melissa. Thank you for joining Hi. us. Um, I think Thanks for having me. Yeah, I think this is a nice transition because, like you mentioned, you know, a basketry is is definitely an influence for you. So um, some of these pieces are in the multiple horizons exhibits, but of course you have pieces everywhere. <laughs> um, can you maybe just share a little bit about your process with this mixed media? Sure. Um, well, this piece is actually, it is a good transition because what uh, the other Melissa was talking about, it made me think of this piece. This, this piece is called Access Denied. 
Uh, it's about three feet by four feet. And uh, it it's talking about how uh, we, we're sort of getting um, more and more limited access to um, uh, basketry materials. Um, uh, in this particular piece, it's meant to be basketry materials, water, uh, there's pine nuts on there, the sort of protruding uh, circles. Um, and, uh, and then I guess uh, uh, um, on the right hand side, it's uh, um, bob wire. Um, and it's, you know, abstract, just kind of meshed together with that idea of uh, just sort of limited access. Um, a lot of the work that I do is inspired by basketry, basketry design um, and uh, textures and colors and um, just sort of the, uh, the landscape area uh, sort of meshed together and, and layered. Um, and that's what my work is about. It's just tons and tons of layer, mixed media, uh, acrylic washes that I sort of make and um, uh, and and pile on top until um, I get the acquired you know image. <laughs> um, we have a comment from Paulette Hennam who shared about the basket collection of the state's park state parks at the former McMillan Air Force Base. Um, and I, yeah, that's an incredible resource that unfortunately isn't often widely available. I think to see. Um, but I just wanted to share that. Um, have you happened to visit that? Um, wh where at? The, at the McClellan, the former McClellan Air Force Base. It's the state parks collection. Yeah, yeah. That that actually um, uh, a couple of shows ago that uh, me and and Sigrid uh, uh, curated together called Interwoven, and then another show called Intertwined um, was in. I other um, uh, California artists visit to that place and um, to see the different, uh, I mean, you know, gr for me growing up, I didn't have access to uh, basketry, you know, I mean, uh, and I guess that's mostly because it became a, a commodity and it became like, if you did have a basket, um, it was sold um, uh, just to survive, you know, and most of the people that I know, family members and, and friends, um, who have, who had basketry, you know, um, from family members, they're really lucky. I mean, most of ours were, you know, kind of got divvied up amongst family and then eventually sold. My baby basket was sold and <laughs> I never even got to see it. And uh, my son's baby basket is the first baby basket that, you know, we know who, you know, who made it and who was in it. And, um, and, and it actually, uh, it inspires a lot of my work because of that story, you know, because of the history of that. I think I love sort of the beauty of you blending these different mediums and these different stories and histories. Um, are, can you tell me a little bit more about what the specific materials are that you use? I know you mentioned some of them, but Sure. Um, so, uh, well, on this piece, um, I have uh, uh, pine nuts on there um, from our area, um, Northern California and um, uh, uh, Western Nevada. And um, uh, some of the other pieces that I work on, I uh, incorporate uh, organic materials like um, tule, um, which is what the, the dress was made from the, like the cattails that grows with the cattails. Um, and then um, uh, willow, uh, which is what we make the basketry from. Um, I uh, um, keep them in whole form and I can go and collect them almost any time because of how I apply them onto a uh, canvas. Um, I don't think we have any of those particular pieces with the willow in, in this show, um, but they're on my website. Um, which um, you could share a link to your website in the comments. So if, if people haven't visited Melissa's site, they really should to see more work. But there's uh, a few pieces in the uh, Multiple Horizon show that have um, sort of uh, small pieces of the uh, willow incorporated into the like basket, sort of abstract basket designs. So um, 
I'm interested to know too, in using organic materials, what does that, you know, how, how well does the piece keep over time? Does it change? Do the colors, do the tones change? Or is it sort of remain to be seen? Well, um, I've, I had probably been putting pieces on there since my son was a baby, since his baby basket inspired the sort of um, vertical arrangement of, um, I don't know if you've, you're familiar with what a baby basket looks like, but it, um, uh, it has the willow um, branches or the sticks um, uh, lined up vertically um, for the, like the, the backing. And, um, and then, um, different parts of the willow are um, taken apart um, and split to twine the pieces together. And also smaller pieces are used for the little baby baby um, sunshade. And um, so like those pieces, um, uh, they're not necessarily, um, uh, I mean, I, I don't need to, to gather them at a certain time or, or for them to be, um, uh, you know, people actually started giving me um, all of these uh, uh, materials when I started. They're like, oh, you need extra pine nuts or something. I mean, usually um, in the fall time when the pine nuts come out, the, um, you know, everybody, you know, kind of gets their, their little, you know, either bag or, or whatever they went to go gather. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a luxury to have, have those things. So, you know, you're never using them to put them on your <laughs> paintings or you know for a decorative or anything so people started giving me their old pine nuts that they would find and I would use them for different things like that do you mind sharing about this piece a little bit I see you know some different symbolism imagery yeah this piece um I was sort of doing a a series where um uh I was just sort of I guess trying to do uh, self portraits, like uh, without doing self portraits, you know, like this this piece um, has the um, sort of a half of a diamond, and and in our tribe the the diamond symbolizes the female, and it's usually on your um, on your baby shade um, for a um, you know male or female, and so this is sort of like half of a diamond. That's why it's called when she is complete. Um, and, uh, and just sort of all of the, the stuff that goes on around your life, whether it be, you know, harmony and peace or chaos and, um, water and sun and, um, uh, fall time and winter time and just sort of all of those things combined. This piece too, we have. I think um, yeah, I think this is the full piece, correct? Or is it well, more of a detail? It's actually um, kind of uh, it's missing the the willow. The willow's at the bottom. Um, and um, yeah, it's just sort of the, the same as the other piece, like um, uh, her place in space, that's me. <laughs> and um, I guess just love of you know, wanting to share uh, our our culture and um, our connection to the land, um, the colors of California and the Great Basin, um, basketry, texture. Do you do you consider this work abstract, or do you think of it as something different? If you were to categorize it, um, well, most of my work. I guess has is was usually abstract. This, I guess, I mean, it has, you know, representation of mm -hmm. of basketry and sort of uh, magnified um, and rearranged. Um, so it's sort of sort of half and half, I guess. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. um, I I still uh, other works that I do uh, gravitate back and forth to. Um, uh, abstract imagery where I'm incorporating all of those things like the uh, willow and the and the basketry design and it's it's not exactly identifiable as uh, you know willow or basketry uh, texture yeah well thank you very much for sharing this work um, 
it's lovely to see. I've been lucky enough to see it in person. So I appreciate you sharing this. Of course, thank you for having me. Thank you, Melissa. Oh, there we go. Sorry, that's the main one. <laughs> there it is. That's the fall. There's the willow. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. Um, yeah. So our next artist is um, Mio Marufo. And um, Mio is Eastern Pomo from the Clear Lake Basin. While her tribe is from Robinson Rancheria, she has lived and learned from other California tribes, including Yurok, Hoopa, Maidu, and Miwok territories. Marufo has learned from many gifted artists over the years, focusing on cultural arts, regalia making, and traditional foods and cooking techniques. She teaches classes in Northern California in these methods, focused on continuing this knowledge and renewing it for future generations. Her digital artwork shows examples of basket patterns, traditional dancing, and Pomo life, and is shown throughout California. Hi, Mio. Welcome. So um, I, I love your digital work, and, and we actually used it as sort of the highlight of this, um, this program because it's, it's just so striking. Um, and a few of the pieces that you have are also in the Multiple Horizons exhibition, but um, some of them aren't. And some of the ones that you sent me, you included these, these poems and these thoughts with them. And I, I really love that. I think it's beautiful. And um, I'm wondering if you can kind of share your process as well. And it's clear that the words go with the image and um, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So in, uh, in 2014, I started drawing what I call finger doodles. And um, I was noticing on Facebook that a lot of the native artists that I know were starting to share their work on Facebook. Um, and it was just kind of like showing the process of, or, you know, oh, look, I, I added some more lines to my work tonight, you know, and I was thinking, what a nice way to show what, what you're going through or what you're doing. And so I started, I started drawing on my phone with my finger. That's why they're called finger doodles. Um, my first one, I was sitting in a meeting. I was really not necessarily bored, but I drew a B because I was in a pollinator meeting. And I was like, I thought, I'll put the, this picture up and talk about the meeting that I'm in so that they can see what I'm doing. And then I started getting requests about, oh, could you draw this? <laughs> could you draw this? But as I was drawing them, I started drawing a lot more baskets. I love our basket designs. Um, I'm Pomo, we are the basket weavers. Um, and so I, I just started falling in love with them. And then I started getting questions about the basket designs themselves and started deconstructing what the designs meant or what feathers we used for those baskets. Um, so on my Facebook post, it shows it, you know, this is actually what the post says today. Red winged blackbird tries out his winter charm to lure her in. Will it be the mistletoe or the basket? It's actually a holiday card. I mean, it's, it was my holiday card, you know, because of the mistletoe, but I thought, you know, I don't want to put a Christmas tree. I want to talk about what it is. It's a season of giving, but I also wanted to add some humor into it. So each of, each of my, my drawings, are kind of the mindset that I'm in. I'm either trying to explain something that's going on or I'm talking about a basket pattern or bird in spe specifically, a design. Yeah, so there's a story there, there's a history there, there's... This is another basket example. Yeah, this one, um, this has actually ended up being the cover for News from Native California. I've been working on this feather basket for a bit. A gift basket of red winged blackbird and mallard feathers with clamshell disc beads and abalone. A basket with no other purpose than to be beautiful. A gift from me to you. 
And I get a lot of questions. What is a gift basket? What is a wedding basket? What is this? What is that? And when I, when I tell people it's actually meant to be beautiful, that's really all it's meant to be. I mean, of course there are some, some more, um, information about the baskets, about the gift basket, what it is for, but really the beauty of it. Um, and I tend to draw my baskets kind of upright like they are, but gift baskets are meant to actually be shown from the bottom. Um, they're much more beautiful from the bottom. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Melissa Malero Moose talked about how she's kind of, you know, her pieces are sort of self-portraits too. There's parts of her in there. Would you say that the same applies to your work, that in some ways they're self-portraits? I would say that in some ways, yes, they're self-portraits, but they're not self-portraits of who I think I am. They're portraits of what's going on in my mind. <laughs> Um, good or bad or indifferent. <laughs> but, um, it, it, <laughs> this one, you know, tonight I'm thinking about the universe. We often focus on that one thing, then suddenly your eyes open wide and you realize there's a billion stars twinkling, waiting. And that was a lot about where I was at the time. You know, it was, I was really feeling bogged down by life and I went outside one night and of course I didn't see this in particular because I don't live in the area that shows the Milky Way like that but I was thinking wow look at all those stars you know what am I worried about this for there's all the rest of that out there I can just look at this image before I go to bed and I would sleep well <laughs> And then this piece, I, I believe, is in um, the Multiple Horizons exhibition, but I thought it tied in nicely with the last two. Tonight, amidst the continuous news and feeling of unsureness, maybe we need to stop worrying for just a moment and lift our hearts in prayer. From my family to yours, we pray as a family for our extended families that you all stay safe and have the opportunity to let the Lord embrace us all during these trying times. You know, that's, you know, no matter who you pray to, what you pray to, maybe sometimes you just need to just remember and to just, you know what, thank you for, for letting me be another day, especially during these times that we're going through. You know, the pandemic itself has affected all of us and these little spots of beauty you know they we can we can bless each other with telling each other you know what we're okay we'll be all right you know pray for pray for yourself but pray for each other too can't add anything to that <laughs> <laughs> So this is the last piece, um, which I, yeah. So this is, <laughs> this is not me, but everybody says, why'd you draw yourself? Yeah. <laughs> it's actually, it's, uh, oh, sometimes when she gathers, she gathers much more. Tonight, the air was chilled. Just for a bit, it reminded me of the ocean breeze. It made me long for the fill of seaweed between my fingers and to use my basket again. This is not about me. This is about the basket. Um, I received a basket, a seaweed basket as a gift. My uncle made it and my husband bought it for me. And I love that basket so much. It's just an open twine bur bur uh, open twine seaweed basket. And it is amazing what happens when you use a basket to do our cultural things. You know, usually I'm taking a colander out to gather seaweed and I took this basket out and it made all of the difference in the world. 
and I drew the basket alone by itself. And then I drew one with a female in there, which everybody thinks is me and it's really not. <laughs> um, maybe it is, I don't know. But I, it was more of an ode to the basket because of the, my first time using it. It was beautiful. I have pictures of this basket on the rock. Um, and when I drew it, I wanted to convey the wind and the air and, and the feeling that I had and the starfish <laughs> with a lone starfish there, which is that little surprise that you find in the tide pool. So, you know, you're looking at green and blue and browns and suddenly you come across this bright orange or red starfish, or you see this flash of blue. And, you know, the ocean, it just, it's my ode to this basket and I had to draw everything else around it. I think that your work is, you know, the images are so full of texture and the things you're portraying, the baskets are all very textured, but this medium is, you know, it's digital, it's flat. And I think that's a really interesting juxtaposition. Um, but, but yeah, the images are full of life for me, so. Thank you so much for sharing you. your work with us. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate being here and looking at everybody else's work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mio. So um, our last artist is Shelly Covert. Shelly is a Nisman and the spokesperson for the Nevada City Rancheria Nisman Tribe. She sits on the Tribal Council and is community outreach liaison. She is also the executive director of the tribally guided nonprofit CHIRP, that's the California Heritage Indigenous Research Project, whose mission is to preserve, protect, and perpetuate Nisanon culture. So, Shelly, I think you're here. So, there you are. <laughs> Hi, thank you for joining us. Thank so, you. Um, I, I know there are so many projects, I think. I think you must not sleep because of all the things that you're always working on <laughs> um, that I see popping up in, in the collaborations. But um, this image, can you tell us a little bit about this painting and sort of its origin and um, share that sure. with us? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Hamakini, everyone. Um, so it's so funny because I'm a musician. I play bass and I sing in a rock band. Like that's that's who I've been before I started my tribal responsibilities um, that you know I'm doing today in this life. Sometimes being pulled and dragged, but it, it's what I'm doing. It's my responsibility. And my friend Judith Lowry is the person who inspired this. She did the um, calling all coyotes at the Mighty Museum. And I kept getting these emails from sort of in the group thread. And I thought Judith was just sort of including me to include me. <laughs> I wasn't absolutely sure. I, I didn't know that I was doing a piece because I'm not a painter. And so pretty soon, you know, I started understanding that, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm being, I'm in the show, okay. Um, and she gave me the canvas, which is huge. I mean, I don't know my, like my inch, but I mean, it's gotta be, you know, it's huge. It's a big canvas. I think we have a picture you can see right okay. here. Yeah, it's really, I mean, to me, it's like, it's not um, in comparison to the large works that Judith Lowry does. It's not that big, but for me, because I'm not a painter, it was, um, it was really large but she gave me the paint and the brushes and the canvas and she was like you know it's the represent we need nice and artists here's the stuff <laughs> it sort of takes away all the excuses i guess um by being provided all of these things and one of the colors that she gave me was her star sisters blue that i don't know if you've seen the coyote and star sisters that she has done a piece of, I think it's six, five or six pieces uh, that is in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC. I actually got to see them in person a few years back when we went back for a language revitalization workshop. But she, part of the paint was, and I'm obsessed with these 
these star, sis star sisters, they're incredible. And so one of the colors that she gave was this star sister blue. And I was like, how can you not like at least try, <laughs> you know, given those, those things. So this took me, it took me so long because I don't know how to, I don't know some of the tricks of the trade. For instance, when I did the, um, so this is the spirit road that's leading to the entrance in the mountain, which is Estomianim, which is our sacred mountain. And my grandpa told me that all life comes from and where we go and we die, and then we go off to the Milky Way. So the white, when I was doing the white, I had taken a couple classes on perspective and color theory and these different things, but I would paint and I had this black canvas and I would paint the white road and it wasn't quite right. So I'd wait till it dried and then I'd paint over black and I'd wait till it dried and then I'd try to do the road again. So it's really, I mean, it looks kind of thick where the road is because I've painted over it so many times. Um, and then she showed me one day, you just take a piece of short chalk and you just kind of go like this on acrylic. And if you don't like it, you wipe it off and you try again. And I'm like, oh, okay. I wish I'd known that before. <laughs> um, so, you know, and then the shading of the mountains, of course, to me, I'm like, oh, it's never quite right. Um, this, this was actually on exhibit at the Mighty Museum in the Calling All Coyote show. And it's next to like Frank LaPena and Judith Lowry and all these amazing artists. And to me, it looks like kindergarten work because it's just like so huge. And I kept trying with the paintbrush to make these small stars and they turn out, you know, they're this big. And so to me, and, you know, because I'm so critical of myself and the work that I'm trying to do, I was embarrassed but as I look back, I, I feel really good because it does tell the story, which is the important part. If I get like, shut up, Shelly, get out of the way of yourself. What I'm doing is telling the story. And the story is when humans were injured or, you know, they didn't die. They could get rejuvenated and could continue life. And of course, Coyote, who is the the contrary or the, the one who's always howling and whining about something that's not fair, he's lazy, he's greedy, he's all the things, you know, that you're not supposed to be. And he was mad that humans could have this extended life and live forever. And he kept bugging creator and bugging and bugging and bugging and howling, um, saying it's not fair, you know, dead should be dead. And so the creator finally got sick of it all and said, fine, once you die, you're dead then. And so the story goes, his son, Coyote's son, went to the tallest pine tree in Grass Valley area, the Daspa at the time. And he, as he was going up the tree, he fell and he died. And so this is Coyote crying to the creator, you know, saying, bring my son back. That's not fair. He should get extended life. And as the story is, is you know, um, it, there's a moral there. There's a deep teaching. Some of our Nisanon stories are like that. They're open-ended. They don't lead you to the absolute, like, this is what this story is about. It leads you to think for yourself and bring in your own, um, bring in your own ending of, you know, the point in this story to me is being be careful of what you ask for, <laughs> if you're, you know, because it could directly affect you. Um, so this is our sacred mountain. And in the top of the mountain is the roundhouse where we go and we die, where we see our relatives again, have our first spirit food, and then we go off to the Milky Way. And this person in front sort of showed up. And I'm not sure who she is necessarily. And later I noticed she doesn't have any arms and I thought that was really strange. She's like, where are her arms? She, you know, she's wearing a bit of traditional regalia with the abalone, um, but she has these eyes that are, she's not alive. She's very light. Um, and so because, because I'm a light person, you know, I get teased by my cousins all the time, you know, cause I'm so light, I don't look Indian, um, but I, I do see the reflection there of doesn't matter what, how light we are, how far the line has been drawn out, that we still continuously, I mean, you've heard all these women speaking of, there's something inside that makes us continue this culture that has been so just crushed over and over and over and over. 
And it's continually the connection with the environment, with the planet, with nature, with the animals. Um, as we work on cultural revitalization, you can't cultural revitalize basket making if you can't get to your basket materials. You can't culturally, culturally revitalize the sacred condor dances because there is no condor population to pull from in an ethical and moral way. Um, so uh, the, it's just this memory to me, this painting of those eyes that are staring of for all humanity, that memory that there is a balance with nature and humanity. And once you strike that balance, then you get these old societies that live for thousands and thousands of years. You know, this piece was uh, also in, in one of a couple of these exhibitions. So can you talk a little bit about this project that you've done for three years, four years now? I think this will be our fourth, fourth year, I think. Okay. Time is such a strange thing for me. Yeah, um, yeah. Right, so Visibility Through Art is one of the programs uh, started through our nonprofit CHIRP, which is the California Heritage Indigenous Research Project. And that is the 501c3 that um, its mission is to preserve, protect, and perpetuate Nisenan culture. And it is tribally guided by the Nevada City Ranchery and Nisenan tribe. And because we lost our federal recognition in 1964, and we're really fighting to get that back, uh, CHIRP ends up being sort of our lifeboat where we can have a bank account and accept donations and write for grants and make these project programs that uh, all these important projects live within. Um, so visibility through art, we work with local artists, which are not all native artists. And I, you know, one of the things I do in all of my leadership is that I listen. I listen, I want to be of help and service. If I'm going to be dragged along to make, you know, forced to do <laughs> to this work, not able to do my own chili stuff that I usually like to do back in the day. But, um, you know, all kidding aside that I don't want any of the work that we're doing to harm anybody, to harm a neighboring tribe, to, I want it to uplift everyone. And working with a lot of non-native artists brought forth a conversation by other native artists who have said, do you know how long and how hard we have fought to have control of our art, of our topics, of our ceremonies, our regalia. Um, and I, I, I heard that. And so while I, I spend hours and hours and hours with artists, we talk about the history, the culture, what's needed for visibility for the tribe. And it comes out in these art pieces every year. And, but at the beginning of everything, it's shared that just because we are doing this here in our community, it is not a free pass for other non-native people just to reach in and co-opt and appropriate and do what they want with native culture. This, the tribe has asked for this. We are looking for visibility specifically for a reason, and that is for federal recognition, our um, advocacy around all of these issues, because everything is so erased. And all of the weight of being visible is on the tribes. The fights at the water to just bring Thule back so it doesn't get poisoned is on the tribes. I know there are other people in the community who care, environmentalists, um, other conservationists who care about animals and, but our societies were, there was nature and there were the, the tribes and the interaction and you had economy and society and all of these amazing things that it is ours and it cannot be taken, it cannot be co-opted without our permission. So if we're asking and the parameters are tight, I check their check-ins constantly to make sure there are no spikes. Um, like, ooh, you know, can you please change that? That's just a little too far, you know, fill in the blank, whichever way. 
And, but it's come up beautifully. Like these are, um, what you're seeing here are these four large paintings. Uh, they're done with actually sage ash. Um, they're very fragile. Judith actually went and had them sealed because they were in such a fragile state. They were done um, by Jesus who is um, an amazing artist. And these are some of my ancestors. That's my grandpa who's the third from the right. My, his mom is on the left of him and my third great grandma on the far left, my great grandpa on the right. Um, but he did these and then gifted them to the tribe. So all of our artists gift their time, gift their work. There's no exchange of money. This is all volunteer and they're absolutely conforming to what we're looking for. Um, I've yet to have an experience where somebody just totally goes off the rail and it's really weird. <laughs> so I've been very fortunate in that way. I constantly go back if there if there's anything because the last thing I want is anybody to be mad at me, you know, um, or shaking their finger at me. Uh, I constantly go back if something does feel a little iffy and I check in and if it's too iffy, we ask the artist to change it and they change it. It's just been really fabulous. Um, but always in the forefront is that this is happening because we asked for it to happen. It's not the other way around. And please don't think that by any means this project that we're doing gives like this blanket permission for non-native folks to go into some culture and just take and reproduce um, whatever they feel like because that is not what this is about. I've noticed this, um, this is very well documented, this project is. And I think, you know, you've done a beautiful job of sharing what you just shared with us now, you know, through the artist Thank interviews. You. That's good to know. Uh, it was actually, I'm, I'm all blinged out in Tiffany, Tiffany Adams jewelry tonight. My yeah. Husband, oh, Tiff, you know, Tiff's the yeah. one that's like, what are yeah. you doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know, hard because I'm not that, I'm not a showing exhibiting artist in that way. And so, yeah. You know, and I mean, that's alive and well in our family. If, if something's wrong, you're going to hear from your cousin, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and her to say, like, you're aware, right, of, and I'm um, like, I think so. So that, you know, was the impetus to put all of that verbiage out to make it hopefully, and I'm glad, very, very, yeah. very clear that uh, right. the tribe beside us may not like this and hate it and don't do it if they don't like it. <laughs> I think that has a, the, a good added benefit of education, especially for non-native people. Like they can look at the project, they can see all this documentation and how you explain it. And maybe they can have a wider understanding and a better understanding of these issues. So nice work, thank you. Um, this is another project that um, is also on, all of these are on the websites that we shared. So I encourage everyone to see those too. Um, do you want to share a little bit about this? Sure. This is uh, this was a Windows Art in Windows project uh, during COVID time, put on by the Nevada County Arts Council. I sit on their board of directors. I'm probably the wor world's worst board of director. I don't I don't feel like I do anything um, except sit there. And when it gets to, if something gets fringy, I'm like, oh, don't do that, you know. And I pop in and out as I do, but. Um, so this was during COVID times, a lot of our businesses and buildings were open in Nevada City downtown. And so they did art in windows, art in storefronts. So a lot of artists, they did a, um, you know, there was an application process to get your art in and there were so many windows and artists got to come in. There was a teensy stipend of, I mean, probably $500 for materials or whatever there was. And so we put this in the windows at the Alpha building, which has been sadly sitting open for a very, very long time, but a lot of space. And this is Hetahani Peamnikwonom, which was, they told me my language was dead, which was my experience when I was young, hearing that the Nisenan language was extinct, that the Nisenan people in Gold Rush country were extinct, and, you know, living through that going, you know, like wondering about identity and who we are um, being completely erased. And here in Nevada County, the whole, all history starts at the gold rush. Like there was no, you know, um, balancing story of like, also <laughs> there's this long, long, long history of the Nisenan people and our interaction with the land. So this is 
it was really uncomfortable for me again because this is actually my handwriting and when it was it this is a really large piece and as I'm, I noticed how, like how weird and um, I remember in school being corrected a lot because my handwriting was always part printing and part cursive. And so when this went up and they just blew it off the computer and then I painted it on the canvas and it was really intense for me just around the handwriting because of how much schooling I missed because we moved all the time. And because my mom, my mom only went to the eighth grade. She actually quit school when one of her social studies teachers or somebody said that Indians were savages and dirty. And she like quit school because of that. And so, but to see the language in our homelands, like big and on display like this, you know, again, it's one of those statements. It's like, um, and we're still here and you've heard from all these panelists today that not only is the, like the California genocide of the Indians and they tried so hard to wipe the cultures out, but yet it's, it's the tribal people over and over again who are holding it together and somehow revitalizing these things that were absolutely targeted for destruction. And you know, I, I just wanted to also throw out there a thank you to Shingle Springs Rancheria um, this, you see this writing system. So Nisanon obviously was a, an oral language. It wasn't written down. So as we're trying to revitalize our language, we're going through these linguist documents and there are, I think I know six writing systems or something. And so Shingle Springs Rancheria, um, through one of their programs offered us language. And we went and we worked with the linguist and Dr. Sherry Tatch, who I did my children's book with. And this is Shingle Springs and Sher Dr. Sherry Tatch writing system. And it's beautiful and it looks so good when it's written. It's my favorite thing. And they permitted us to go ahead and use that writing system. And this is up at Friar Patch, which is one of our stores. It's a co-op, local co-op. And it's on the wall as you walk into the store. And there's something about that. It might seem little or it's one project here and one project over there. And then, you know, when there's just so many topics to be involved in. But when you see it, it it's just incredible for me. And also I hear in the, the opening, the land acknowledgement that the Crocker has adopted and is saying now, this is the third or fourth time I've heard it with that land acknowledgement and recognizing the Nisan nice people. I'm mentioning Nevada City Ranchery. I mean, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. It, it's, I mean, I hope that we lift each other, each other up together. And the way that I've found in all these creative ways we have to be present to be visible, art is like the back sneaky door. People don't get their defenses up. You don't have to argue and debate history and facts. And well, this book says, you know, that Sutter loved the Indians and they came there by choice and the Indians loved the missions and all these things that we learned in school. Um, you know, we can speak for ourselves and we can tell our own history. And someday I hope that the language is back there again. And it takes all of us and we lift each other up. And if I ever do anything that hurts someone, I hope they tell me, because that's not the intention. And it's just all beauty, um, but it's hard. It's hard work. And we need the rest of the population to get it and to get it quick for, for, before the water and the plants and the animals are all gone. <laughs> Kelly, this has been incredible. Um, I know we could talk for two more hours about all of the projects and all the things that you're doing. And again, if anyone who's watching right now, now or in the future, hasn't gone online and, and supported your cause of restoring, um, you know, your tribal sovereignty, I encourage everyone to do that. Um, and also, I just want to thank every single panelist here. If you want to turn your camera back on or not, um, I want to thank all of the women who shared their work, shared their time and their energy. Um, it's been an incredible gift tonight to us. I really appreciate it. I want to say, um, if you're interested in seeing more work like this at the Crocker, 
through temporary exhibitions or in the permanent collection. I would encourage all of us to hold the Crocker and our board of directors and senior leadership, our staff and our members and our stakeholders accountable to how we are furthering local representation, local native, local California Indian, local indigenous representation within the museum and within the arts community. Uh, you can contact the museum or our board of directors and make your voice heard. And we're gonna share a couple links um, of ways to do that in the chat. So um, once again, thank you all so much. Thank you, Shelly, thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Sigrid, thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Mio, and I think Melissa, other Melissa had to leave, but I wanna thank her as well. Um, and this has been a wonderful evening and I hope you all have a very good night.